All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Tim here, and this is BXJS Weekly Episode 59, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. Yeah, I mean, we got some stuff today, not that many releases uh, for whatever reason, but quite a ton of libraries and demos and some pretty interesting articles. So let's get started, I guess. The first two articles we got here today are from the V8 developers team and uh, they are called Blazingly Fast Parsing. The first article talks about optimizing the scanner bit of the V8 engine. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, wouldn't go, uh, I won't go into details in the podcast itself, but if you have any interest at all in knowing how the V8 works, how the JavaScript engines work, then this is definitely an article to read. There is some very interesting details here that I personally, for example, didn't know before reading this article um, that this is the way that actually the parsing happens. So it is very, very cool and very interesting to read. And, you know, I already mentioned this more than once. I think this the V8 dev blog is probably one of my most favorite ones in regards to the low level uh, sort of inner workings of JavaScript engines. The second part of the article is talking about lazy parsing and it specifically talks about the, um, you know, figuring out how the code should be exactly um, parsed in a lazy way so that it's more efficient, uh, it doesn't allocate as much um, heap and so on and so forth, right? So again, if you are interested in V8 workings, inner workings, and how exactly does your JavaScript code gets parsed, and what exactly happens to it once you execute it, then definitely do have a look at this one. It is really, really good. And I would suggest reading both of them essentially. All right, next article we got here is objection to ORM hatred. And it's from the author of um, Objection JS, I think. Yes, exactly. So it's, um, I guess the title is a pun, right? <laughs> objection to ORM hatred. hatred. And it talks about that ORM hatred is actually don't really, you know, it's not really justified because um, he argues that people go with saying, hey, okay, so you don't actually need ORM because it just hides the SQL. So it's you are better off writing the SQL yourself. And uh, the argument usually followed by a contrived example that shows a very simple query, something like select from pets where name fluffy order by species and that's it, right? But in reality, once you start working with the real data, your queries rarely look that simple. Majority of time you write very complex queries that do joins, that do selections, sub queries and stuff like this. And you end up writing a really big query that is quite complex, right? So to ta tackle this, you start writing code that abstracts some stuff and does the generation for you. And as the author here says, congratulations, you've just reinvented the ORM, which again, you know, if you have a very complex case, you might be better off using the actual ORM. And he, um, the rest of the article essentially demonstrates how Objection.js, the ORM could simplify things for you and specifically simplify the query that is shown in the beginning and why it might actually be better than writing queries by hand because there are some very interesting optimizations done under the hood, which is kind of cool. So if you are still uh, heavily opposed to RMs, but uh, not completely sure why, or maybe you heard the introduction and decided that it might be a good idea to revisit them, then definitely do have a read and, you know, I think that all tools essentially have their place uh, if you use them according to the uh, use case, right? So I wouldn't say ORMs are an absolute evil or an absolute best thing, but if you just use it whenever it makes sense, then it's gonna be good for you. So that's basically all I have to say. If you wanna know more details, again, check out the article. There is some uh, pretty good examples. The objection actually, I never used it myself, but it actually looks quite awesome. So I might as well try it out in the next project. All right, continuing, we got a horrifying global this polyfill in universal JavaScript. Uh, so here's the thing, turns out there's a global this proposal um, that's already stage three that I somehow missed completely. I'm not sure how that happens, but uh, the idea of the proposal is to introduce a unified mechanism to access global this in any JavaScript environment. The problem we have now is that this typically points to, well, a lot of different things depending on the environment you run uh, the script in, right? So if you're running in browser, for example, it's gonna point to window. If you're running in browser, it also is gonna point to frames. 
if you're running in web worker, it's going to point to self if you're running in node, it's going to point to global and so on and so forth. And that's like, I think the last case is actually this, which would work in um, standalone JavaScript engine shells, right? And it's a bit of a pain in ass to get this manually, like there are like a bunch of hacks to do that. And the proposal of this pack is actually pretty cool. Now, um, here's so this article is from Matthias Binance, uh, who is one of the V8 developers. And he talks about why is it actually not that easy to polyfill this. So the naive polyfill just does it in a very simple way, checking, you know, if type of global this is not undefined, then return global this type of self return self type of window and so on and so forth, right? You just check if the object exists and then return it. Now, the problem with it is that it might not actually work, especially if we're talking about type of this, because this might be overwritten, for example, by bundlers. And then there's the rest of the article essentially explains how to do some JavaScript magic with defined property to actually get proper this proper global this. If you're curious, do make sure to check it out. There is some insane stuff happening. And there's variable literally called magic and property construction and deletion and it is crazy. Like it's very well explained and very, you know, reasonable. But when you look at the code, you go like, what, what is this? What am I looking at? But it is really, really cool. So if you're curious, make sure to check it out. I mean, if, even if not, uh, if you're interested in seeing what does it take to actually polyfill something as simple as global this, you know, you would think, do check this one out, there is some really cool information here. All right, next thing we got here is experimental Node.js testing uh, the new performance hooks. So this article talks about the performance hooks that recently has been added to Node.js. Uh, the package is perf underscore hooks, right? I think we already talked about them once or twice on the podcast. Uh, but essentially, in this case, the article showcases how you can actually use them uh, along with a performance observer uh, to make sure, for example, your requires are fast enough, right? So yeah, if, if you want a basic introduction to performance hooks in Node.js, then I guess this is the article to look at. Um, if you already know how they work, you won't really find anything new here. It is a quite basic introduction. Next article we got here is bulletproof Node.js project architecture. Uh, now, here's the thing. So first of all, this article talks about the Node.js uh, or specifically express app uh, architectures and how to structure your folders, how to split your code and so on and so forth. Uh, here's the thing, there is no such thing as the universal perfect architecture for all cases, right? So in my experience, depending on the project that you are doing, architecture might differ wildly, and there's no ideal approach. While there are some good ideas in this article, do not take the whole article as you know, the only way of doing things and just read it as a reference point And just look at the things that the author mentions, essentially, there are some good ideas here and there. But don't think that this is essentially one architecture that will solve all your problems as this is likely not the case. Um, nonetheless, if you are interested in a different ways of structuring your express app, make sure to check this one out. Uh, be warned, the author is using TypeScript and using uh, object oriented programming quite heavily, which uh, I don't know, at least to me, that just feels a bit weird when you have ExpressJS and then a bunch of classes on top of it. But you know, I guess if you like object oriented programming, you're probably gonna uh, be immediately familiar with what he does. So there you go. All right, next article we got here is how to know what to test from Mr. Can See Dots that uh, deep dives into the figuring out what kind of tests you should write for your code and what exactly should you be testing? Should it be the implementation details, which is usually a terrible idea? Or should it actually be your use cases, right? And talking about things like that uh, use case coverage is actually better than code coverage and what exactly you should be noticing in your code and so on and so forth. So if you are just getting into testing, or maybe you've been doing testing uh, for quite some time, but still not quite get some things and trying to figure out, you know, this is makes, I mean, uh, it takes time to figure out what exactly how exactly to write tests, let me phrase this this way, right. So if you're still struggling with it a bit, make sure to check this one out, it does 
a very good job of summarizing the sort of best practices on thinking about unit tests, I guess, not unit, just testing in general. Uh, but yes, if you are already well versed in testing, you won't really find anything new in here. Um, so yeah, I guess you could safely skip this. Next article we got here is new features bringing native add ons close to being on par with JavaScript modules. This is um, overview of features that are provided by Node.js to uh, native add ons as in the add ons written in C++ and then compiled to be shipped with Node.js. And how do they compare with uh, typical JavaScript modules? So it starts with a very basic um, sort of list of features that you typically, or list of things you have to consider when working on JavaScript or native add-on modules. And then it goes to expand what exactly changed over the last Node.js versions and how exactly does this affect uh, development of native modules, things like N API and context-aware add-on and cleanup hooks, right? Um, so if you are writing or working with the native modules and or if you're planning to do that, then make sure to read about this because, I mean, there's been... So N API, introduction of NAPI has been a pretty significant change to the node uh, native modules uh, creation, essentially. So if you're not familiar with the concept, then make sure to read this uh, because it does give a good overview of essentially what happens uh, after the NAPI introduction. Right, next article we got here is interpreting TypeScript. It talks about uh, essentially writing your own tiny uh, TypeScript interpreter to run uh, TypeScript directly in Node.js. And what it is essentially is a very basic article that introduces the TypeScript compiler API, right? So if you wanted to do something to TypeScript compiler, I guess this is a very good starting point because it will guide you through, um, well, everything you know need to know to work with it by writing a simple interpreter. Um, yeah, that's basically all it is. All right, continuing, we got dynamically update positions during drag using React Beautiful DD. So, Again, a very basic tutorial that shows you how to use React Beautiful DND and immediately update the position of item that user drags. It's it's very basic, right? So it's nothing um, super complex, but if you are using React DND and was looking for a recipe like this, I guess there you go. All right. Next thing we got here is exploring the hidden potential of JavaScript arrays. The article that sounds very scary, but in reality, it is just an introduction to uh, your common array methods. Uh, I think we had more than one already on this podcast like this, but you know, there's always more. So if you are doing JavaScript for quite some time, if you already know all the array methods, you won't really find anything new here. If you are just getting started with JavaScript and uh, learning about things like filter map, a flat map, reduce, and so on and so forth, Make sure to check this one out. It actually does have some uh, good info on those uh, methods, essentially. That's basically all that is. All right, next article we got here is Course Tutorial, a guide to cross-origin resource sharing. This is an article that takes a look at the course, the circumstances under which it is actually needed, the benefits, and how to actually configure your backend uh, Node and Express app specifically to support cores. Um, cores can be a big pain in ass, especially if you don't, don't control the backends, but it also can help you quite a lot in protecting your backend from uh, third party attackers, essentially. So if you're not familiar with the concept, make sure to read this one. It gives a good um, introduction to it, essentially. If you already know what course is and how does it work, then you won't really find anything new here. Next article we got here is getting 60 FPS animations in React. Uh, essentially talks about uh, using CSS, um, I mean, they call it hacks, but it's not really a hack. So it's like CSS properties to enable GPU acceleration on React animations, right? Uh, the cool thing is that they're basically not just code, but there's also a very cool interactive examples that show you how does animation looks with, you know, just rendering it with JavaScript and then enabling hardware acceleration and doing the same exact animation, which looks like 10 times smoother, right? Because it's it's now powered by GPU, which is way better. So if you're working with animations and uh, didn't know about that, do check it out. It is a pretty good introduction. Next article we got here is making a calendar in vanilla JS. Uh, just as the title says, this is a very basic tutorial on you know beginner level 
that teaches you how to make a very simple calendar using uh, vanilla JS and HTML. So if you are just getting started, this is a very good place to uh, try out essentially the kind of basic code, right? If you are coding JavaScript for quite some time, then you won't really find anything amazingly new here. It is just a very basic calendar. All right, next thing we got here is React Hooks Cheat Sheet, Unlock Solutions to Common Problems. Just as Dial says, this is a collection of common uh, things you would typically do with hooks. I wouldn't call it cheat sheet because um, the examples are actually pretty extensive in some cases. And again, this is, I'm not sure I would, um, Okay, so let me let me rephrase that. So on one hand, this is a pretty good collection of examples on how you use hooks in React to achieve various things like, you know, using multiple state variables, using object state variable or using effects, right? Like basic side effects, effects with a cleanup and so on and so forth. On the other hand, I think majority of the things listed in this article are actually available in official React docs. So unless you just want it all in one uh, document, I don't know why would you go here instead of just reading the React docs. You know? But there you go, this thing exists. So if you want, I don't know, maybe one pager with hooks, then do check it out. Next thing we got here is React visualization libraries in 2019. This is from the KubeJS team that I covered, I think two or three podcasts uh, before. So they are building this sort of all-in-one visualization platform. And uh, while doing it, they had to evaluate a bunch of different visualization libraries for uh, React to figure out which one they would use. And this article sort of summarizes their experience. The cool thing is that it's not just listing the libraries and telling arbitrary pros and cons, but it also shows you the actual code that you would need to run it as well as the real life working example on code sandbox that you can uh, you know just fork yourself and see how exactly it works for each library. So if you are doing data visualization and if you were looking for react libraries to do that then do uh, check this article out it had, does a very good job at essentially showcasing all of the available um, charts and visualization libraries uh, out there for react. There you go. All right, next thing we got here is choosing the right Node.js framework, Next, Nuxt, or Nest. And I just want to note that it feels a bit weird because Next is React framework, Nuxt is Vue.js framework, but Nest is a backend framework, at least as far as I know. So I was a bit confused by the title here, but the article actually does a decent job of um, explaining, um, you know, what is Next.js, what is Nuxt.js, how do they work, how does the basic Hello World app looks, what are the advantages and disadvantages and how does performance looks. But then again, the performance part feels even weirder because again, you know, React and Vue, you have to render them and there's like a VDOM and stuff and all of that is complex. And then you got Nest.js, which just does templates and obviously is gonna be faster, right? So it's just, it's a bit weird. But if you want to, I mean, at least you can use it to compare Next to Nuxt. So I guess that works. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there you go. All right, next thing we got here is uh, Animation Performance 101, Measuring with DevTools. The article that essentially introduces you to using Chrome DevTools to measure animation performance and debug it and try to figure out what exactly is the bottlenecks for your animations. If you did not know, uh, Chrome DevTools provides absolutely amazing um, tool set for debugging animations and redrawing and so on and so forth. So this article essentially talks about how to use them, including stuff like uh, paint uh, layouting, paint flashing, layer borders, um, screenshots during performance, uh, slowing down animations, slowing down network, and so on and so forth. So again, you know, if you're working with animations, you're already familiar with all of that. You won't really find anything new here, but uh, if you are currently starting to work with animations and not sure how exactly to debug them and figure out why do they look choppy, why do they look slow and so on and so forth, then this article will do a very good job F at basically explaining how to do that. All right, uh, next thing we got here is Frontend Developer Handbook 2019. A pretty large free book uh, talking about everything frontend development starting from learning what is internet and web and what is web browsers, what is DNS and so on and so forth, and going to learning 
um, pro progressive web apps, um, headless browsers, offline development, multi-device development, and so on and so forth. So if you are, I don't know, I guess if you're just getting started, it's going to be pretty invaluable. I, I mean, it's from the front end master. So I assume it's of a high quality. I haven't had time to actually check through all of that. I did click on some parts and it seems solid. Uh, or if you are, you know, somewhere in the middle, but still not quite sure about, for example, what is Node.js? Well, there's a whole section about that here. So you can actually learn and uh, figure out uh, if that is something that you want to deep dive into. And yeah, essentially, it's like a collection of uh, links related to the topics and a list of topics that you have to learn to become a front end developer, which again, not necessarily all of those, but uh, it's a decent collection. The next thing we got here is another book from Frontend Masters. This time around, it's called JavaScript ES 2015 Enlightenment. And it's essentially an introduction to all the new features that have been added since ES 2015 and uh, how to use them and uh, what do they actually do, right? So if you are still used to writing old JavaScript and want to learn more about ES uh, 2015, or later, then do check this one out. It does a pretty good job of essentially outlining all of that stuff. <laughs> all right. I think that's it for the articles. So now we come to the tiny, awesome bits things. Uh, the first one I want to highlight today is this uh, article from TechCrunch called Wither Native App Developers. And um, it discusses the state of mobile reports. Uh, I just want to highlight one of the things. Um, Non-native cross-platform development platforms are growing in popularity. And there's a quote from the report saying, we scanned Microsoft's iOS and Android apps and discovered that 38 of them, including the likes of Word, Excel, Xbox, and many others, were recently updated to include React Native. In the last year, use of React Native has nearly doubled, which is kind of mind-blowing. So... Yeah, there's a bit more data in the article if you're curious, but it is really interesting to see how the hybrid frameworks really, you know, increase in popularity significantly. This is like, and especially among, you know, the big guys like Microsoft and uh, a bunch of others. So if you're, if that's interesting, do check out the article, there's a bit more data. Next thing we got here is adblock plus filter list may execute arbitrary code in web pages. Hey, if you are still using adblock plus, I don't know why you do that. Please uninstall it and use uBlock that basically is 20 times faster and better and you know, doesn't have any bullshit like allowed ads, which is, yeah, I mean, okay, whatever. So here's the thing. Um, adblock plus has a directive called um, dollar rewrites that allows you to change some things, right? To rewrite URLs, essentially. This is what it's supposed to allow. Well, in reality, you can actually abuse it to inject a bunch of things into um, any page that user navigates to. So here's an example of a rule that once you navigate to Google Maps, will actually re-navigate you into the Google and inject um, arbitrary script in there, which in this case is just a harmless alert document dot domain. So once you are redirected to the Google, you will actually see the alert. But you know, if you can inject arbitrary script and it will be executed in page on the domain that you are at, this is quite severe security risk, right? So again, if you're using Adblock Plus, why are you using it? Switch to uBlock Origin. And just, yeah, forget about Adblock Plus because this is just bullshit. Like, uh, the interesting part is that the uh, uBlock Origin specifically doesn't support the rewrite option specifically because of this issue, because the author of the uBlock Origin brought this security concerns initially once, you know, explaining why he didn't implement that. And hey, what do you say? <laughs> it actually is a concern. So there you go. All right. Next thing we got here is Sherlock Holmes and the mystery of trash and node modules. This is, oh, how would I say? This is a very amusing on one hand and very sad on the other hand um, article about the guy who went to grab some stuff in his source code and accidentally found um, a whole tom of Sherlock Holmes in his node modules, which is a 1.9 megabytes TXT file. So there's a module called readline which is, you know, uh, 
there's a read line module now that is natively in Node.js. So you can actually use the native one and don't care about that. But this is sort of a polyfill for older versions, right? Uh, here's the thing. So for tests, for some reason, it uses, well, Sherlock Holmes book, like complete one, 1 1.86 megabytes. It's in fixtures. It would be okay if it would be just in the repo. I mean, I still don't understand why you would need the whole thing, but it's not just in the repo. So if you go to the uh, like package for BR or whatever, and if you look at the read line, the size of the package is 1.87 megabyte, which is a hundred kilobytes more than, or no, not even hundred, it's probably less. I think the, the actual source code is, where's the read line JS? It is 1.93 kilobytes. So, out of 1.87 kilobytes, uh, megabytes, just 1.93 kilobytes is actually the useful code, which is, it just makes me sad. So I, I just want to say, you know, if you are a Node.js developer, if you maintain some modules, please make sure they are as small as possible. And please don't include Sherlock Holmes in your fixtures and publish it on NPM. It's just uh, like, it's unnecessary, right? It shouldn't be there. It is ridiculous. And it could have been excluded with a simple npm ignore file. But uh, I guess our author didn't care enough for that. So please do care about your Node.js modules, okay? Uh, they had many old books. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, likely there's something like, yeah, on Gutenberg projects, uh, there's also archive.org, right, that do the same thing. So, but why would you need a whole Sherlock Holmes book in your fixtures? You're testing the read line. You can read lines from like, file that has one, two, three, four, five. That's like 20 bytes. So it's, yeah, it's just weird, but you know, whatever. All right, continuing, we got um, create React app roadmap for version 3.0. So there's, I think they already published the alpha version actually, but this essentially outlines what the version 3.0 is gonna have, including the latest version of Jest, the integrated ESLint plugin for hooks, the integrated ESLint plugin for TypeScript, uh, specific browser list support uh, to the, um, added to the presets uh, and for Babel, and absolute imports using JS config and TS config. So again, you know, if you're using Create React app, I guess that's an exciting news for you. Okay. Next thing we got here is an intent to implement from the Blink team, uh, intent to implement the SMS OTP Retriever API, which would essentially allow developers to programmatically read SMS messages that are delivered to user phones. So this is the mobile specific thing and uh, essentially allow you to eliminate the manual step for one-time passwords sent over the SMS. Now, while this is really cool that you know you can essentially use SMS and your web app will read it, it will only have access to the SMS that are specifically for your app. Uh, there's the use some sort of specific signing for that. The problem with it is that SMS OTP is probably one of the most unsecure OTP um, methods ever because the SMS is extremely susceptible to the man in the middle attacks which, I mean, it's nice to have, but it's just like use time-based passwords. It's like way more secure, right? So, um, but yeah, there you go. That's the thing. I, I, I just really hope that at one point we won't have to use anything like this and we'll have a better ways of protecting ourselves. But, uh, you know, for now, that's, I guess that makes it a bit nicer. All right. Next thing we got here is the weirdest JavaScript syntax. Um, uh, I mean, it's like on one hand, I get where this is coming from. So the, the idea is that your function call, you can assign something to your function call, right? Now, if you ever read ES or JavaScript spec, ECMAScript spec, you know that there is a type called a reference, right? So you, for example, when you call a function with an object, you don't actually pass the object by value, but you pass it in by reference, right? And the same, same things works the other way. You can, you could, I don't know if, if you can actually do this now, but you could return references from functions, uh, which means that when you call a function and assign to it, you actually assign to the reference that is returned from that function, which starts to make sense immediately. Now, the thing is that I don't know if it's possible anymore because I, as far as I know, there's no way to explicitly say, hey, I'm returning a reference instead of returning an object, right? 
unless it's it has been passed in before but uh, basically uh, semantics but it is interesting that this is actually a valid javascript and you can actually do something like this which again you know if you write it in this way um, as in function call equals value that looks confusing as hell but if you rewrite it to hey variable something equals function call and then you reassign this variable it actually is no longer that scary and actually makes kind of make sense but yeah references are always confusing as hell and uh, maybe making them explicit would make it easier but i don't know uh, there we go that's the thing basically all right now we got the releases section the first release of the week is react beautiful dnd &D, the one with hooks uh, in quotes almost so yeah the, it's it's a new version which bumps the react peer dependency um changes some minor things under the hood well they're actually breaking changes so be sure to um look through them when updating they don't seem to be that terrible so it should be relatively easy to migrate and yes hooks are coming quite soon so this is pretty cool uh, the next release we got here is next.js version 8.1 that adds support for AMP formats, uh, AMP pages out of the box and uh, seems to be quite easy to set up. I am still not sure if I like the AMP format. I kind of like the idea behind it to be, you know, this super fast and efficient mobile format, but I mean, it's like, I don't know. It's just, I have mixed feelings, but it's, it's kind of cool that the next year basically supports it out of the box now. Okay, that is it for the releases. Now we are coming to the libraries and demos section. And the first thing we are here today is Webini, Webini, I'm not sure how to read that. Webini, I guess Webini JS, serverless CMS with GraphQL and React. And by serverless, they mean that it actually deploys to the Amazon Web Services and uh, works in, a, you know, as a function as a service essentially. So. If you were looking for something like this, do check it out. They also offer a um, hosted version as in they will manage it for you if you are interested, obviously for a price. Uh, the open source one is MIT licensed, so you can just deploy it yourself and do exactly the same thing for free if you, if you know how. All right, next thing we got here is Stream Hot. Stream your terminal to web and vice versa. A tiny script slash website that allows you to stream uh, terminal to anyone without installing anything or streaming stuff from web into your terminal which also works which looks i mean i can see a few use cases for that so you know maybe you too so do check this one out uh, next thing we got here is merm render restful rendering pipeline for generating sequence and uml diagrams using mermaid for markdown docs uh, essentially diagram as a service as it mentions and uh, yeah it just takes the mermaid's js format which is quite nice if you never used it it's a very uh, cool way of doing graphs and diagrams very easy to do and uh, provides you an api for essentially sending the uh, document and getting back the image there uh, seems to be some uh, problems with the demo last time i tried it actually worked but uh, there you go you can deploy it yourself and try it out. It seems to be working quite nicely. So if you needed something like this, do check this one out. Next demo we got here is assembly script, a TypeScript to WebAssembly compiler. So if you ever wanted to write some modules in TypeScript and then make them way faster using WebAssembly, then now you can. So it is a subset, again, so you know, you won't be able to compile all the TypeScripts to WebAssembly, obviously, because there are limitations. But uh, it is a very neat way to do like CPU bound operations, for example. Um, so there you go. Next thing we got here is Dragon Binder, a one kilobyte progressive state management library inspired by Vuex. Um, just uh, blah, blah, blah. Let, me, <laughs> let me try this again. Just as the title says, this is a state management library that is framework agnostic actually and works with, well, just about everything. Um, yeah, it's 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 very object oriented seems nice so i guess if you were looking for another state management library do check this one out um right next thing we got here is speedy js accelerate javascript applications by compiling to webassembly so uh, we had the typescript to webassembly what this one does is literally tell takes your javascript and compiles it to webassembly to make it faster uh, which, you know, might work in some cases. Um, the interesting thing I want to note here is there's, there's some benchmarks here, is that 80% of times it doesn't actually make sense to do that because, you know, you 
have exactly the same performance as the baseline, sometimes even worth what is kind of amusing. But obviously, if you take the CPU bound operations like calculating Fibonacci sequence or, you know, doing other things like checking primes, obviously, this is going to be way faster using WebAssembly, right? Uh, there also seems to be some weird bugs with WebAssembly um, uh, environments. For some reason, they are using Chrome 58 for tests, which is, I think, ancient. I'm not sure if Firefox 53 is new because Chrome 58 is like 20 versions before what it is now, right? So it's like 74 now or something, uh, which makes it a bit weirder. But that's the thing that exists. And if that sounds interesting, do check it out. And next thing we got here is JavaScript Cloud Image 360 View. Uh, it basically allows you a widget that allows you to create 360 images of your products uh, from a bunch of photos. So you just have to specify how many photos you have. Uh, what is the rotation and we'll do the rest for you. It's very straightforward, very simple. Uh, if you are looking for something like this, do check it out. Next thing we got here is toasted notes, easy, flexible toast notifications for React. Looks like this. They just pop out from, well, anywhere, custom ones, not custom ones. Uh, looks quite great. So, you know, if you were looking for toast notifications for React, this one might be quite good. Next thing we got here is Vouter, a minimalistic one kilobyte routing for React. Nothing extra, just hooks. Yet another hooks only uh, router for React. This time around it actually has a declarative API in addition to just hooks. So you can actually define the routes and links, uh, well, pretty much in the same way that the React router does, but it's just all in one kilobyte. I guess for very simple cases, it would be actually perfect. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. And next thing we got here is React on Lambda, a JavaScript library for building React applications in a more functional way, alternative to JSX. Uh, there's a bunch of those things, right? But uh, this one is, I, I mean, you know, it's not much different from existing alternatives. I'm not sure how, like it doesn't even compare itself to any other existing project. It just compares itself to JSX, which I think is a bit unfair, but there you go. Can I just note one thing? So in the source code examples, the author here uses the Lambda symbol to, um, well, do everything, right? So it imports Lambda from React on Lambda. How the hell am I supposed to type that on my keyboards? I am pretty sure I do not have a Lambda symbol on keyboards. So how do I, I, I'm just a bit confused, but um, I mean, it looks nice. <laughs> so if you were looking for yet another alternative to JSX, make sure to check this one out. Maybe this is what you wanted. All right, next thing we got here is file type. A module that allows you to detect file type of buffer uint8 array or array buffer. Essentially allows you to um, take chunks, for example, and detect the mime type by just parsing the headers, right? So it's quite straightforward and quite nice. So if you are doing something related to files, make sure to check this one out. It's a module from Mr. Sindra Soros, as usual, super tiny, super fast, and super efficient. Next thing we got here is 3D Shooter. Oh yeah, that's a crazy one. Um, this is one of the um, craziest demos that I think I've, I've seen this week. So someone built a multiplayer shooter in a browser with Node.js in the backend, but that's all irrelevant. Uh, that essentially to render 3D, it just uses CSS and 3D transformation. It looks bonkers. Like all of that is CSS. So the 3D stuff that you see on the screen is pure CSS. And uh, if I allow all of the scripts here and we join the match, uh, you will actually see that, uh, come on, work already. Is this, oh, there we go. You will actually see that you can, you can walk around, you can move, you can shoot, and you can actually kill other people if there are any. So when, once they release the demo, there were more people here. And all of that is pure CSS. So there's no actual WebGL or Canvas or 3D or anything like that. It's just insane. That's, that's like, there's even collision detection somehow. I'm not, I don't know how that works, but this is just crazy. So that, yeah, that's the thing that exists. And you can uh, have a look at the source code in uh, on GitHub if you are curious. Next demo we got here is Bastillion, a web-based SSH console that uh, centrally manages administrative access to the systems. So essentially just as it says, you know, it's a web-based terminal uh, with a bunch of administrative functions. If that is something you were looking for, do check it out. 
it is a very weird mix of JavaScript and Java. So uh, make sure you are prepared to handle Java because it requires JDK uh, 1.9. Right, uh, the next thing we got here is Node MS SQL. It's a Microsoft SQL uh, server client for Node.js, basically all it is. So if you are working with MS SQL, maybe you didn't know about that, do check it out. The next thing we got here is Karmatic, Easy Automatic, Headless Browser Testing powered by Karma. Webpack and Jasmine. So if you were working with a stack but wanted all-in-one solution, then this one is for you. Next thing we got here is DSAJS, uh, data structures and algorithms explained and implemented in JavaScript. Um, it is quite cool. And there's even a book available to explain all of that in more details. But if you ever wanted to know how does array, linked list, queues, stacks, trees, binary trees, maps, whatever, work, how can they be implemented and how do you actually implement them in JavaScript, then well, this um, repository have you covered. There's also like a bunch of different algorithms that you typically get asked on the, um, um, what do you call them? The interviews, job interviews, right? So uh, if you are learning all that stuff, make sure to get a look at the source code because it is quite good. All right. Next thing we got here is Iconate, or Iconate, I'm not sure how to read that, a fully customizable and accessible vector icons with MIT license. Uh, they have a really cool website where you can actually customize a bunch of things on the icons, the looks, the color, and so on and so forth. And then just export all the icons and also test it in dark mode and so on and so forth. So that looks quite nice. There's a bunch of icons here. All that is pretty tiny SVG. So if you are looking for icons, do check this out. Next thing we got here is Android JS. Uh, build Android apps with JavaScript, HTML, and CSS based on Node.js. Uh, this seems to be yet another Cordova-like environment with a bunch of frameworks I've never heard about, like Phonon and Onsen. I'm not even sure what is this, but it also supports Angular and just plain HTML and CSS. So if you were looking for yet another hybrid framework for Android, but for some reason you don't want to take React Native, then do check this one out. Next thing we got here is nValid, environmental variable validation for Node.js. A module that allows you to uh, take your environmental variables, validate them, and um, export, the, sort of convert that to an object that would basically be uh, used in your app as a config. Um, looks nice. Although you know, I, I never, I don't, I don't think I ever needed to validate my environmental variables. It's a hard word to say, but yes, this is a thing, and you can do that. And I guess you can crash early if they are broken. Maybe that's that has some valid use cases, but there you go. Next thing we got here is match sorter, a simple expected and deterministic best match sorting of an array in JavaScript. Just as that says, it's a very straightforward algorithm. Um, yeah, works on, well, just about anything as a nice docs and everything. It is from uh, Mr. Cat, <clears throat> let me try that again. From Mr. Can't See Dots, uh, who's been on this podcast for quite some time now with his uh, articles and uh, demos and libraries. So there you go. Next thing we got here is Bauer, uh, Bowser, sorry, Bowser, a uh, browser detector uh, that has some advanced features, uh, such as, you know, from the basic, it basically you can just parse the user agent and then get the browser or you can uh, validate it by running a satisfied function that provides a bunch of conditions. Like you can specify that, okay, if we're on Windows, we want to explore more than 10. If we're on Mac OS, we want Safari more than 10 and 11. Otherwise we want Chrome 20 and so on and so forth. You know, like it, it looks pretty nice. So if you're working with the browser restrictions, make sure to check this one out. Next thing we got here is bootbox.js. A bootstrap models made easy, uh, essentially an addition to bootstrap JS that allows you to, uh, well, easier work with models, I guess. Although I'm like, you know, this depends on bootstrap and this depends on jQuery. So unless you're working with them specifically, you won't really find this useful. Next thing we got here is react JSON uh, for, blah, let me try this again, react JSON schema form a React component for building web forms from JSON schema. So the idea is that you uh, specify the schema and the form is essentially automatically generated. Might be useful if you are working a lot with uh, 
complex forms because this seems like a nice way of doing that. Um, all right, uh, actually, like this is nearly all with the demos. So the next one I want to show um, is well, it's not actually JavaScript. So the the uh, source code is available here, but it's majority of it is Python. There was um, there was a demo from Nvidia where they demonstrated the um, uh, gun network that allowed you to generate visualization like realistic photos from very rough sketches. And this is this is exactly what it does. So someone implemented this demo and made it public. So you can draw things like okay, so this is going to be C, right? We're going to take some sky, and we're going to put it over here. We're going to take some clouds and like add them on top a bit, right? And then we're going to take, okay, so we're going to have, um, I don't know, dirt over here. And then there's going to be some grass. And after you click a generate button, you will actually see a realistic photo, which is damn impressive to be honest. So this is someone's private demo, right? And okay, there's some weird stuff happening on it, but it actually looks quite good. And you can be like, okay, so we can actually take, uh, I don't know, there's some fog hills, river, you can, you know, we can take and make a river over here. And that would actually, like the fact that this works is just mind blowing. And all of that is open source. So if you're curious on how it was made, or if you're curious, if you want to make your own version of it, do check it out. This is just super impressive. All right. And the last demo we got here today is perf.link uh, live JavaScript benchmarking that allows you to, uh, well, essentially run a simple benchmarks in this sort of way. I, um, this, there was another website for that, uh, that sort of went up and down for quite some time. I'm not sure if that's still a thing, but this looks very slick and very nice. And if you want to do some JavaScript benchmarking, then do check this one out. It might as well, um, might as well be your pick because it looks pretty sleek. All right, that is it for libraries and demos. And before we wrap this up here, I want to show you the last article, why software projects take longer than you think, a statistical model. Now, uh, you know, the idea that estimating how long will it take for you or for a team to code a project is, is actually hard, right? So it's really hard to figure out how much time is going to take to build something. Especially so if you lack knowledge in some areas and you know, okay, so you know, if, you go, if, you, if you're building this thing X, we're going to need Y, but we don't have expert on Y, so we're going to have to learn it. So we are not sure how much time it's going to take. Now, it's always easy to say, okay, you know, estimate and then double it. But that actually, according to this statistical model, that actually doesn't really work. Now, uh, the author here, he didn't just do some imaginary calculations. He actually found a data set uh, of real projects and uh, estimations that developer did we said, okay, so this is how much we estimate it's going to take. And this is how much the project actually took and did some statistical analysis on the data set to figure out the difference and how much you actually have to adjust your timing to make to hit this, you know, ideal time it would take to do that. As the yeah, there's there's the reference to the data set, which is uh, very interesting. So again, you know, if you are interested in statistics or maybe you're interested in estimating projects, make sure to check this out. It is pretty fascinating. All right, um, that is actually it from my side. So as usual, all the links can be found on GitHub or on bxjs.dev website. Um, if you guys have any questions or suggestions, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. If not, we have a very nice uh, Discord chat with a lot of people. Feel free to join it and ask for questions, ask for help, ask questions, or suggest your own things. Um, or, you know, if you just want to talk about JavaScript or video games, we're always there. Um, yeah, that's, that's basically it from my side. Doesn't seem like there's any questions or suggestions. So this has been uh, BXS Weekly, episode 59. Thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you have a great weekend and I see you next time. Bye.